everything else. They're concerned about so many things. You know, Jesus had two women one time uh, host him in their house. And uh, both of them were sisters. They had the same parents. And uh, as you know, one of them was called Mary. And the other one was called Martha. Mary sat listening to Jesus as he spoke. And Martha went to the kitchen to try to fix something for Jesus, which was not bad at all. But the Bible says she got worried that her sister hadn't come to join her, to help her fix the food and make all the preparation for Jesus. So she went to Jesus and said, Master, why don't you tell my sister come help me in the kitchen? There's so much work to do. And Jesus said, Martha, Martha. You know, why didn't Jesus say that all the time? See, when she came to complain, it just gave Jesus the opportunity to lecture her about her lifestyle. Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you worry about so many things. So it wasn't just that Mary didn't come to help her that was a problem. It was one of her ways of complaining. She couldn't even, she couldn't even overlook that since there was a guest. She didn't even think, let me not embarrass, let me not embarrass my sister at this point. She forgot if both of them had been in the kitchen, who would have been talking to Jesus? He would have just been there waiting as though he came to eat. Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you worry about so many things. But one thing is needful. He said, only one thing is needful. And Mary has gotten it. And then he said, and nobody is going to take it away from her. In other words, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do what you're asking. What about the food? I wonder if that food was sweet that day. Because she would have returned to the kitchen grumbling, unhappy, who knows? I'm not sure she appreciated Jesus' answer so well. Maybe that was why she complained when the brother died and said, if you had been here four days ago, and convinced the sister to think the same. And the sister came and said, if you had been here four days ago, my brother wouldn't have died. In other words, you're the cause. See, don't be worried about anything. You know, some people are worried about the children's school fees. The bill is coming. It hasn't come yet. They're already worrying. Every time they see the landlord pass by, their heart jumps. They're owing him now. Maybe three months or three years. The people who are worried, they're so worried. So worried they look much older than they really are. Now somebody said, but if you have a lot of problems, isn't it right to worry about the problems? Well, you've been worrying so long. Has your worrying brought the money? No. Has the worrying made anybody to help you? No. So why do you worry? Why does God tell us not to worry? <laughs> ah, I'm laughing at you. Why does God tell us not to worry? Can I tell you? Because of what worry does to us. If worry didn't affect us, he wouldn't bother about our worrying. He'll tell us, worry, worry. Somebody said, be worried. Be very worried. Why? Because some things gone wrong. Maybe the economy. Maybe some policy of government. God doesn't want us to worry because of what it does to us. Worry sets up a magnetic force that attracts to us everything that's consistent with worry. With the, um, what do you call, the eye of the storm. In other words, the central point of what you worry about has its fears. For example, let me take a very simple one. Worrying about the children's school fees. All right, you worry not that the money is available, you worry that the money may not be available 
when you need it. Or you worry that it may not come. Or you worry that it is not there. And so they may be sent out of school. Which means worry has its fears. All right? Worry has its fears of its negative possibilities. We may be sent out of the house. We may lose the job. You don't worry that money is coming. You worry that it may not come. You worry that the pain you have may be more complicated than you realize. What if, it's, what if this is an incurable problem? What if, what if? So worry has its fears of negative uh, possibilities. And that's what God wants to stop us from. Because worry sets up a magnetic force that attracts those negative possibilities to us and makes them possible. The human soul, I want you to understand this, that's very important. The human soul, the human spirit, all right, the inward man has an ability. Remember that man was made, created in the image of God. He is like God. In other words, he functions like God. He looks like God. He functions like God. All right? The Bible says that God made man in his own image and in his own likeness. In other words, he looks like God and he functions like God. All right? Now, if God, if God wants something, he doesn't need to ask. His simple imagination of it creates it. That's why we say your imaginative power is your creative ability. Worry helps you imagine the worst case scenario. Worry helps you imagine negative possibilities. And your imagination of those negative possibilities crystallizes them. Worry helps make your fears possible so God says be anxious for nothing be worried about nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made known unto God and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding shall garrison your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus Refuse to be worried. Repel worry. Repel it. You say, I refuse to worry. I refuse to worry. Now, when, when worry attacks you, don't think it's going to go away just if you change your mind. Because worry is a spirit. It's not going to go away just because you say, I changed my mind. That's why the Bible tells us we should take unto ourselves the shield of faith. He says, with which ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And what do we have also? The sword of the Spirit, which is the rhema of God. In other words, you need to protect yourself, protect yourself with the helmet of salvation, protect yourself with the breastplate of righteousness, Protect yourself with your loins got about with truth. Protect yourself with your feet shod by the preparation of the gospel. That's your boots, right? Then defend yourself with your shield of faith. You see, you got to protect yourself with all of this and defend yourself with your shield of faith. Then go on the offensive with the sword of the spirit which is the rhema, the rhema of God, the word of God for the now that's spoken to you, that belongs to you now concerning your situation. What does God's word say now? I refuse to worry. Why? He said in nothing be anxious, but in everything, and this is one of them, praise God. I pray and supplication with thanksgiving. I make my request known. What do I want? He says, don't worry about anything. Declare what you want. What do you want? He says, what do you want? Worry about nothing. Declare what you want. 
and then give thanks to God because it is done. Hallelujah. When you give thanks because it is done, he says, the peace of God that surpasses understanding. In other words, here you are, circumstances don't look right. Everything looks like there's trouble. How can you be at peace in the midst of this trouble? He says, that peace of God that surpasses understanding. Others can understand how you can be at rest with all of this trouble. How you can be at rest with all of this trouble coming out against you. With all these challenges. How can you be at rest? He says, yet it is possible and it is happening. Because he calls it the peace of God that surpasses understanding. It beggars understanding. It dwarfs understanding. It is that peace of God shall guard your hearts. Guard your hearts. Hallelujah.